There sits a glossy giant of the waterways. BBC Four goes beneath the waves of Howard's Way. People come up and say, oh, I just loved Howard's Way. Why don't they bring it back? No one in their right mind would sink all their savings into a, a tatty little boat yard at the time of a tatty. recession. I don't think we quite realised how big it was going to be. Suddenly, one in four people in the country knew who he was. May your tails start ringing. <laughs> and never stop. I think if Charles Dickens was alive today, he probably would have written Hours Way. I don't think I could ever love a man as much as I loved the flying fish. You left your dreary drab life and you went off to the always sunny Solon. It was almost a kind of airlock between the weekend and, and you know, the drudgery of, of Monday. Well, now that you're here, I'd better give you a tour of the factory and a cup of tea and the biscuits. It was Thatcherite Britain, let's go for it, you know. Well, it's like watching a period piece, you know. It was the 80s. It's in the 80s that our story begins. We were living in Thatcher's Britain, watching imported US TV like Dallas and Dynasty, and generally obsessed with big. Big fashions, big music, big hair, big pay packets, big mobile phones, and big numbers of people on the dole queue. But what did any of this have to do with a hugely popular Sunday night TV show about people and yachts? Well, as a matter of fact, everything. Gerard Glaister had been one of the creators of the quintessentially 70s Sunday night drama, The Brothers, set around a family haulage business. Ten years on, he convinced BBC One controller Jonathan Powell that he had an idea for a new series that would tap into the new mood of the time as successfully as The Brothers had done a decade before. So where did Glaister find the inspiration for his new show? And why was he so sure he had another hit on his hands? I think he was smart enough to be one of the first people to realise that we were about to be flooded by American programmes. And Dallas was so popular in this country and suddenly we were about to get Dynasty and Falcon Crest and all of those things. And I think he picked up on the nation's hunger for something a little bit different and something that Britain really didn't do. I'm quite sure that, that Jerry Glaser knew what the British public wanted and the fact that Dallas and Dynasty were so popular must have prompted him to think, we can give them something like that. We can do the, the English version of that. You know, there's a very conscious attempt, I think, to, to take what worked so well in The Brothers and give it a glossier, more transatlantic look. So if the Americans had J.R. and Sue Ellen, Blake and Alexis, oil fields and mansions, presumably Glaister and Howard's Way co-creator Alan Pryor had equally glamorous British equivalents in mind. Well, not exactly. Originally it was called The Boat Builders and they changed it and I think that was probably due to Jill Holmes scripts because it came, became very clearly one man following his destiny and the fallout of that journey. The Boat Builders would have been a, a dreadful title. I imagine that people interested in boats would have turned on and been terribly disappointed, and the people that would want to watch it probably would have thought it was going to be a boring program about boat building, so I, I don't think that was ever a serious prospect. Having corrected one wrong tack, and with the show now under its new title reflecting the focus on Family Howard and its business, Glaister began to assemble the cast who would inhabit the fictional south coast town of Tarrant. Tracy Childs had worked with Glaister on Cold Warrior and had appeared on TV in a variety of period frocks, but playing daddy's girl Lynn Howard would see Tracy facing a sea change. I was taking sailing lessons and starting off in what I thought would be 13 episodes of a drama series. Lo and behold, <laughs> I ended up in a six-year series called Howard's Way. Glaister cast Edward Highmore as Lynn's conservationist brother, Leo. And when it came to the parents, he plumped for Jan Harvey as the Howard Dynasty's matriarch, Jan Howard, a woman whose desire for a quiet life was about to be destroyed by her husband's redundancy. The role of Tom Howard, head of the family and unexpectedly unemployed future boat builder, was taken by Maurice Colborn. Maybe it's time I took a few risks. Look where playing safe has got me. 
Glaister revisited another of his earlier successes, Secret Army, and picked Stephen Yardley to slip into working class boy made good, Ken Masters' shiny leather loafers. Vulgar Earth. He should have stayed on his barrow. Okay. <laughs> Cast as the object of Tom's extracurricular desire, Avril Rolf, was Susan Gilmore, despite a fairly loud note of caution from her agent. She did say to me, which I thought was rather odd at the time, I think you'll get it, because it's totally right for you, but it might ruin your career. <laughs> um, so I, th I thought, well, I'll take a risk. Hers wasn't the only risk. Glaister had a simple idea, take the glamour of the big US soap imports and translate it into a UK setting. But in Britain in the 80s, there were certain things it was impossible to ignore. Would the Sunday night audience really want to sit down every week to watch the Howards cope with a very contemporary crisis? There's something I have to tell you all. Tom, if it's another boat, I should go mad. <laughs> I've been trying to find the right moment, but, well, there isn't a right moment for this sort of thing. The fact is, I've been made redundant. Tom, no. The start of it is a man who, in his early 40s, suddenly finds he's out of the aircraft industry, has to find a job or make his own way, take a golden handshake and find a, a business in which he can get involved. He chooses the latter. And that is very much today. Let's face it, despite its present-day relevance, redundancy wasn't the most glamorous proposition for a Sunday night audience. But Glaister knew he could sugar that pill by setting the show in a world of wealth and aspiration. The Howards owned a yacht, the Flying Fish. They were part of the moneyed middle classes. But even for them, redundancy meant gallant sacrifice. You do realize, if things get a bit dodgy, we might have to sell the fish. But you said we were okay. At present, yes, but if the worst comes to the worst. The bad news, the poor souls had to sell their beloved yacht. The good news, Glaister and his team pulled off a masterstroke. Somewhere between the yachts and the shoulder pads, Howard's Way captured the ethos of the 80s. The show may have been closer to kitsch than kitchen sink, but it soon became branded with a very political label. I think it was absolutely a Thatcherite drama. Me generation, selfish, greed, you know, climbing to the top, what do I want, what do I want to aspire to? And I think it was of its time, and it's very easy to put the Thatcherite label. If anyone had ever put that at the beginning, I would have been off down the corridor quick as anything, because I was always out protesting at that particular time. Howard's Away is a series that seems to embody something about the 80s. It seems to want to seduce you with aspirational images. This was the new moneyed class asserting their wealth, trying to safeguard their wealth, and trying to accumulate wealth all at once. There's no kind of moralising about that particularly. It doesn't seek to show us that if you try and accumulate, accumulate money for yourself, you will sell your soul or you will become you know, a, a, a yuppie of the dreadful kind that you'll end up as some kind of Southampton Gordon Gecko. The yuppie culture was good value for television programme making. What Howard's Way did so brilliantly was made it a family soap. The show's instant popularity was down to more than just Glaister, however. He had a very good crew on board. Writer Jill Hyam was looking for a change of scenery after a recent stint in the jungle. I'd just finished Tenko and I was very anxious to do something completely different so I wouldn't be typecast. And of course, there's nothing more different than Howard's Way and Tenko. I won't be going into this with my eyes closed. I know exactly what I'm letting myself in for. Initially, what interested me was particularly in developing the women characters because in the treatment that I was shown, they were very black and white, nothing, you know, one-dimensional, Jan Harvey, baddie and so on. And I've always worked from character, so that was what fascinated me. You talk about the years you've wasted. Well, what about me? I spent my whole life building all this for the family. What right have you got to throw it away on some pathetic ego trip? She did create wonderful female characters. I mean, we have to thank Jill for, for, for this completely because she created the original characters. And when you look at the Avril, Rolf and Jan Howard and Polly Urquhart and people like that, they were driving forces in their own right. And that was unusual at the time. And for veteran director Pennant Roberts, who already had a long list of classics to his name, it wasn't just the lure of the open seas that drew him to Howard's way. I sensed that it was a series about how, how a silver spoon can tarnish 
when the circumstances aren't right. How this particular family, once it started to fall on hard times for various reasons, no matter how well blessed they were beforehand, um, how, how the family life could, could fall apart. The crew weren't all old hands, though. Raymond Thompson was fairly new to television when Glaister gave him a shot at Howard's Way. And I was originally hired just to do one episode, and, uh, and it all worked out. They had struggled very, very much to, to get the right flavour and tone from a writing perspective. And, um, and it just happened that I, I, I think I hit the mark on my first script and, uh, and, and became lead writer, basically, for, for the series. While the writers worked on the scripts, the actors prepared for their new roles. Some of them learnt to sail, but Stephen Yardley decided to go where the new money was. He did his character research on the Costa Blanca. So off we went to Benidorm. We went to this hotel. It was um, chicken and chips and Viva España. And it was wonderful. And I saw this guy, and he had this gold necklace on, and he had a yellow shirt slashed down to the waist, and he had his cigarettes and his gold lighter on the top. I said, and, and bracelets everywhere. I thought, oh, I think that's Ken. I think it is. On Sunday, 1st of September, 1985, BBC One launched its new 13-part drama serial. The opening bars of the theme tune, a yacht race, 80s high fashion, Tom Howard's redundancy and Ken Master slapping his girlfriend's backside all helped to make the show an instant ratings winner. It sort of became part of the Sunday evening. I mean, hotels changed their dinner times to you know, fit in with Howard's Way, and ministers didn't go on too long in the pulpit, get home for Howard's Way. It was appointment television that I know that people would rush home and everything stopped uh, to watch Howard's Way on that, uh, that Sunday evening. Howard's Way just caught the public imagination. They just loved it. So much so, in fact, that we wanted to get a closer look at the action. The, the householders that we knocked the, the door on and said, no, we're from the BBC, do you mind if we come and film, I'm sure, had no idea of how their lives would be transformed by, by busloads of people coming down to have a look at their, the Howard's house. By the second year, things were getting busier and busier, and by the end, it became impossible because the show's popularity went out of control. So some bright spark went, let's set up Howard's Way weekends. You go and visit all the filming sites, they go, they take a boat out on a cruise and, and take it all around the Hamble and, and, uh, and things like that. You'd have lunch at the Jolly Sailor and there'd be uh, big boat trips that would come up the river and point out the local points of interest. But of course, we were still trying to film. And we'd suddenly hear from the water down below as this huge vessel with 200 people on board came up going, and on the left, you can see the Jolly Sailor pub. So we'd just all turn around and, and the director would say, company wave, and we'd all turn around and go, hello. <laughs> and then they'd go away. So we became a victim of our own success, really. But that success was a sign that Glaister had pulled it off again. Millions tuned in each Sunday, and for the cast, this meant a slight raising of their public profile. The dustmen used to come very early in the morning and collect, and collect my rubbish, and they used to shout up to the window, go back to Tom. <laughs> Episode six aired, and I had a day off on the Monday, and I planned to go shopping with my mother. And we just had to abandon the whole trip because I could not get down the street. We were in a supermarket, and I was buying something, uh, and this guy came up to me and said, oh, excuse me, Ken, do you get a bonk it? I said, I'm sorry. He said, do you get to bonk it? I said, you'll have to watch next Sunday, won't you? <laughs> and it kind of got slightly racy, but only slightly, so you could still watch it with your teenage kids and not worry about it. If I wanted to delay Jan Howard, I wouldn't choose the back of a car to do it in. No, you say that for the likes of me. Of course, having one of your young actresses spend a rather large amount of time in skimpy clothes wouldn't have had any effect on the ratings, would it? The show did kind of cash in on all that stuff too, and frankly, I was 22 and in those days was very happy to flaunt it. <laughs> that passionate affair. I, it was huge fun to play, and actually getting all the attention and getting all the male fan mail didn't hurt at all. That was lovely, thank you. I'm not going to complain about any of that. <laughs> but it wasn't just Tracy who got a bit racy on Sunday nights. That's lovely. Have I seen it before? No. No, Ken slipped it to me between the hors d'oeuvre and the entree. 
Even if the weekly update from Tarrant hadn't grabbed you, there was one thing about the show that was almost impossible to ignore or avoid. Well, if you ever mention you're in Howard's Way, people often start singing the song. I think one of the great things about Simon May's music is it's not complicated. And that's why his theme tune for EastEnders and the theme tune for Howard's Way is easily remembered. Simon May's music was a huge part of the success of, of the series. Indeed, the theme music became such a success it was eventually released as a single, with added lyrics sung by Marty Webb, and went into the charts and onto Top of the Pops. That was extraordinary. That took off in a way none of us could have imagined. I mean, you couldn't get in a lift for years without it playing at you. As sure as winds keep blowing, love will be Where I happened to be at, at Wembley and uh, the Coldstream Guards were out uh, and they've got a magnificent band and they played, they play. and if you ever hear, a, it's wonderful with a brass band, it's a fantastic theme and I went, oh, my tune, <laughs> you know, which you do. Audiences of around 14 million were tuning in every week to follow the drama. So were Glaister and the Howard's Way team putting all that at risk by adopting a typically American way of ending their first series. Cliffhangers in those days weren't normal. Um, so they had decided that they were almost certainly going for series two and they wanted to leave the audience wanting more, as you should leave every audience. So they built in this fantastic end to the first series with me walking in on Charles Freer and this woman in bed. Ah, oh. Lynn, this is Honey Gardner, my wife. Me running out in floods of tears along a wet pontoon in the pouring rain. <laughs> Tripping, falling, hitting my head and disappearing into the water. And the music starts, that fantastic music. And we made people wait from November till the following end of August, September, before airing the next episode. It astonished me that the public stayed waiting to find out whether Lynn had drowned for nine months. You know, I mean, it was extraordinary to hold people's interest for that period of time and, and to get them back in their droves for series two. The nation went berserk trying to find out whether I was alive or dead. It was fantastic. Add to cliffhangers like these, the weekly dose of business intrigues, the relationship scandals, the backstabbing and the I'll get my own back. And you can see why Howard's Way faced accusations it was moving away from its serial drama roots. We started as a drama series. There is no question. We started as a 13 part drama series and I think the change happened episode nine of series one. Maybe that was when Charles Freer arrived. Tony Anholt's character sailed into the series. And I think everything just cranked up a notch or two. It's not that reality went out of the window, but we were prepared to twist it to the very end of its belief. In the beginning, it was also going to be a drama series I had thought, and certainly hadn't expected it to turn into the soap that it became. I wanted to, to write a drama series, basically, and I still consider it to be a drama series. The critics would, they always tend to want to label it something, and so they would label it soap, but what is soap? I mean, soap is human drama, it's, it's human interplay. It's, it interweaves all the themes of love, conflict, ambition, betrayal, intrigue. You would not look uh, episode 13 or whatever, or 16 or whatever it was, off the last series of Howard's Way, and the first ever episode of Howard's Way, you wouldn't look at that and go, that's the same series. If you actually could blot out their faces so you couldn't see who what anyone actually looked like, you would not know that was the same program. Um, it had changed so much. Howard's Way was a soap. I mean, what else would you call it? I mean, why else, how else would you describe a show where a woman seems to run 
a thriving fashion house from her Mobin kitchen. Oh, hello, House of Howard. Oh, could you turn the kettle off, darling? You know, that was the beauty of Howard's way. So let's consider the life of Jan Howard. How did she go from a housewife in the middle of a marriage breakdown to an international fashion guru in six series? Well, after her husband Tom invests in Jack Rolfe's boatyard and starts an affair with Avril Rolfe, Jan's marriage is on the rocks. She seeks solace in both business and the bedroom with wide boy Ken Masters. By the end of series two, Jan's fashion business is in great shape, but then her French designer and new son-in-law Claude is tragically killed in a boat accident. Many tears. Jan recovers, rebuilds the business, divorces Tom, dumps Ken, and gets engaged to sexy septuagenarian millionaire Sir Edward Freya, then breaks it off. By this time, Lynn, her daughter, has recovered from the death of husband Claude and is back in Tarrant for series six, in which Jan launches a new fashion label, House of Howard. Lynn gets back with old flame Charles Freya, son of her mother's former fiance, and Jan's son's ex, Abby, who is the daughter of Jan's daughter's ex-ex, gets her own back on her father, who just happens to be Jan's new son-in-law, Charles Freya. Meanwhile, Jan has made House of Howard into an international success, and she finishes the series toasting her son, Leo, taking over the boatyard that once belonged to his father, her ex-husband, Tom. The end. Expand that to about 16 different characters and you have a tangled web of human drama or soap. Whatever you called it, the Sunday audiences loved it. They also loved Howard's way bringing the F word into normal Sunday evening conversation. Fashion. At the time, Howard's way fashion was high fashion. Um, the producers, you know, revealed that they would go down to the clothes show and they would go and see uh, designers, you know, in London, and Jan's outfits were very, very agonised over it. Of course, she'd take your eye out wearing some of those shoulder pads now. There were whole groups of uh, women, mostly, admittedly, who would phone each other up after the show, trying to spot which designer I was wearing in which scene. And they had this, you know, I think, they, you know, was that a nickel for it? I don't know, no, I think, you know, was this Scada? So people were watching the television and seeing some incredible fashions being shown. And I think that got the women really caught on to the series. The show also had its very own style god. Enter Ken Masters. How did the record go? We had a designer on the second series called Sue Peck, and she said, I think for Ken, I think we'll start wearing him with, with V-neck sweaters with no shirt. I said, don't bet nobody can. She said, yes, we can. If we get a really nice, a good sweater, it'll look fantastic. And we'll wear it with a white pair of trousers or something, and we'll have a nice yellow V-neck. I said, it won't work. So I think it will. Instead of putting me in a boring gray suit, they could put me in anything, really. And people go, oh, that red really doesn't go with that pink. It really doesn't. <laughs> but it would with Ken. I don't know anything about fashion. Now a study in seduction with the moves and medallion to match, Ken was about to unleash his piece de resistance in his conquest of Jan Howard. I was taking her to a, a restaurant where hopefully we could have a bit of dancing. And you could see him practicing his dancing. It was very like a sort of a very bad Mick Jagger do, doing his dancing. And I thought, I've got to put this in because it is so Ken. You know, the, it's so naff. It's perfect. And she arrives in through the door and sees him practicing and he gets terribly embarrassed about the whole thing. Ken, Ken. what are you doing? Uh, nothing. If Howard's Way had originally mixed the British and the American, it was about to up the ante with the arrival of Ken's nemesis, Laura Wilde. Pleasure, Jerry Glaster had already worked with Kate O'Mara on The Brothers, and bringing a bit of the bitch back from Dynasty to Tarrant proved irresistible. Laura Wilde was a law unto herself. She was um, very ambitious, very tough, very uncompromising. Um, she was also allowed to be witty. I had some very witty lines, uh, very funny lines. Morning, Ken. Morning, Laura. You've got eyes in the back of your head. I just happen to be downwind of your aftershave. But Ken was completely swept off his, uh, off his feet. And, but she was quite a hard businesswoman and very tough. 
But he didn't see that at all, of course. He just, uh, just saw this beautiful woman. He thought, another conquest. Uh, little did he know. She treated him very badly. I seem to remember a scene where I left him floundering in the Solent and, and, and just drove off in the motor launch and left him in the sea, literally. <laughs> then he did turn, of course. He did turn on her and uh, realise what was going on. And uh, he doesn't forget things easily, Ken. No, no. Get his own back. That letter officially terminates your services with leisure crews. It's signed by the new chairman of the board, Ken Masters. You can't do this. Oh, I think you'll find out I can, Laura. Whilst in the middle of filming Series 5, tragedy struck the show when on the 4th of August, 1989, Maurice Colburn died suddenly. We had no warning at all. I mean, his death was such a shock. Um, and what's appalling in that situation is, as people, you are grieving. But actually, as colleagues, you have to get on and do the job. So we had to keep on working. I mean, we were back on set the next morning, so uh, there was very little time. I remember... Um, Edward Highmore, who played my son, came over. Immediately he heard. It was like as if we needed to be together to just um, look after each other, I suppose. So it was exactly like a family. The last series just felt very strange. Um, because he, he was Tom Howard, it was Howard's Way, and it just sort of lost its centre. Howard's Way came back for one final fling. The sixth series would be the last. It was great to leave when people were saying, oh, no, no, why? You could go on. Much better to go with them wanting more than, thank God, that's over. <laughs> I think Jerry Glaster felt six years was enough. He'd already got his next series lined up, ready to take over from us. I remember the, the, the last day we, we filmed was down quite aptly in the mermaid boatyard. It ended with the Howard family standing around with a glass of champagne. And I just looked to the side where there was a gap where Tom should have been. And that was actually how we ended it. The final episode aired on the 25th of November, 1990. Three days earlier, Margaret Thatcher had resigned as prime minister. Both Thatcher and the show that had been labeled with her name had crept into the 90s, but they will forever be identified with the previous decade. I mean, Howard's Way contains the essence of the 80s. I think if, um, you know, if every art, cultural artifact from the 80s was destroyed and incinerated, apart from tapes of Howard's Way, people in the future would still be able to cap catch something of the, of the zeitgeist of, of Britain in the 80s. It did have real ambition, I think, and it went on for six years. The viewers never really fell out of love with it. Almost two decades may have passed since Howard's Way sailed off into the TV sunset, but with the show now available on DVD and still showing on cable and satellite, it's certainly not been forgotten. I mean, the DVDs are selling like hotcakes and people are tipping up at stage doors to get them signed. Um, people still talk about it, still love it. But when filming started back in the mid-80s, it would have been impossible to predict the effect the show's popularity would have on all those involved. I remember my first day's filming. We were all sitting there with kind of mineral waters or orange juices or something in the blazing sunshine, looking at this stunning view. And I remember Jan Harvey saying, let's not ever get blasé about this. Whether this series works or not and takes off or doesn't, let's not ever forget how lucky we are. And I think and hope we never did. Stay with us, Jonathan Meads is exploring the pull of the magnetic north next. <laughs>